Uh, children, you can now be dismissed at Children's Church. Just head on over there to the door with Vinny. Please turn in your Bibles to Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6. We will begin with the word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we do thank you for this day and this time. We just ask now that you would bless this time and help me to present your word truly and correctly, Lord, and that it would change our hearts and lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> During World War I, German general Erich Lundendorf famously observed, the English, they fight like lions. Yes, a staff officer famously replied, but they are led by donkeys, which proved true during the Battle of Gallipoli. The British Secretary of State for War gave British General Sir Ian Hamilton the command of the amphibious landing in Turkey. The Turks were allies of the Germans, so the British wanted to take them out of the war. Hamilton led the group of British, French, and Azak, which is the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, in the battle. In 1915, Sir Winston Churchill was first Lord of the Admiralty, and he hatched a battle plan. Hamilton was tasked with taking a force of 18 aging battleships and charged them through the Dardanelles. The Dardanelles is a 38-mile-long narrow strait that led towards the Turkish capital. The strait was fortified with forts up on the high bluffs. The British lost five battleships, mainly to mines, but also to Turkish coastal artillery. The Turks really didn't have a modern army in, or much in way of good artillery, but the commanding terrain made a frontal attack very difficult. In fact, their neighbors, the Greeks, which were adversaries, had devised a plan that they, they made a war plan in case they ever had to go into the Gallipoli Peninsula and it called for 150,000 men to do the job, overwhelming numbers to get the job done. Lord Kitchener of the British Secretary of War scoffed at the estimate. He thought that the Turks would cut and run at the first sight of the Allies coming. So he sent half as many men to do the job. And you've got to remember, back World War I, during this time, during this age, the British were the big dogs on the block. Okay? They had colonized all throughout the world, and in fact, their navy, going all the way back to the early 1700s, ruled the seas, even up through World War II, and then the United States took that on after that. But they were the big dogs on the block, so I mean, you know, 150,000, we don't need that. We've got all the modern army, military, we're the world power, you know, we're going in this battle, we're going to take care of business. Early on the morning of April 25th of 1915, Hamilton launched his enormous amphibious assault. Unlike the D-Day landing, they did not have the specialized landing crafts for their troops. The huge warships towed stringlings of cockleshells, essentially lifeboats, towards the shore, then split the strings and transferred the towing job to so slow, shallow draft boats, and some of those were even rowed by oars into the shore. They also, one of the landing crafts was an old steamer, the River Clyde. As the soldiers emerged from the port doors, the Turk gunners on the high bluffs were picking off the troops one by one as they came out those port doors. In fact, on that particular ship, there were 200 soldiers. Only 21 of them made it out alive to the shoreline. Meanwhile, General Hamilton was overseeing things from the grandest battleship, the HMS Queen Elizabeth. While Hamilton was on the battleship out in the strait, he was too far from the shore to see what was going on, and so were his commanders. It was complete chaos, and the junior officers on shore were left to their own devices. The communication was weak, the communication was feeble, and in some cases, the communication between the generals and the battle troops was non-existent. Away from the heat of the battle, there were 2,000 British troops that had landed at Y Beach, which was undefended. They scaled the cliffs unopposed. 
With no commander to enact Plan B and no direction from Hamilton, they hunkered down and they did what the British do best, boiled water and had tea. <laughs> they could hear the battle in the distance, but they had no idea that their Australian and New Zealand allies were getting slaughtered at the beachhead to the north. The Turk defenders were very few in number, but they possessed the high ground. And really, all it would have taken was that 2,000 troops there to come down the beach, have a flanking maneuver, and in minutes, literally minutes, they could have taken out the Turk gunners, boom, won it, and then continued on inland. Due to Hamilton's haphazard planning, the beachhead that the Anzac forces were able to secure was cramped and highly vulnerable. In fact, one of the British commanders suggested an immediate evacuation. But Hamilton replied, there is nothing for it but to dig yourselves right in and stick it out. You have got, you've gone through the difficult business. Now you only have to dig, dig, dig until you are safe. Remember, World War I was what? Trench warfare. A very horrible, you know, types of battles. At one point, the clueless Hamilton wired Kitchener saying, thanks to the weather and the wonderful fine spirits of our troops, all continues to go well. After eight months of pointless trench warfare, Hamilton and his forces evacuated the beaches. Half a million men had died on both sides in a true standoff, all for nothing. You can say a standoff is definitely a loss. And yes, it can be said that incompetence and a lack of communication here was big factors that lost the battle. But I think also from what you see in the story, it can be said that it was complacency on the part of the British. We, you know, we have an idea, you know, if I say the word complacent, complacency, we all have an idea of what that means, but sometimes looking into the definition gives you a better picture of it. And the de definition in the dictionary is showing smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. It is marked by self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual danger or deficiencies. The British and Hamilton were complacent. They looked and they dwelled on their past accomplishments of everything that the British had accomplished over centuries and their great power. They thought to themselves that we're the big dogs on the block. We got all the best equipment, better than these guys. I mean, they're just, you know, out in the woods, don't know what they're doing kind of thing. And we're the big dogs. We control the seas. These guys are the JV team. Where have we heard that recently? Um, anyway. We only need half as many men to take these guys. And in fact, we have time to go up and have tea before we decide to go into battle. Complacency lost them the battle. As Christians, as we walk with the Lord, complacency is a silent killer that sneaks up on us. And I had to turn to Amos, and it's one of those books you don't go to very often, you're not there very much. Uh, Amos chapter 6 is where we're going to be looking at today. And Amos is one of God's prophets, and he is active around approximately the year 750 BC. And there were several major sins of the uh, Israelite people. And you got to remember at this time in history, when David was king, Solomon was king, Israel was all one united kingdom. After Solomon, it was divided in two, and you had Judah, and then you had to the north Israel. And both had kings, and in Israel, during the whole time that they, you know, after Solomon's death to their downfall, they did not have one single godly king that followed God at all. Now Judah, they definitely had kings that followed after God, did the right things, but then they also had a lot of bad kings. But Israel will fall much sooner than Judah, and it was because God blessed uh, Ju Judah because of their good kings. And Israel, it came to the point where God kept sending prophet after prophet after prophet saying, guys, turn back, it's not too late. Uh, you know, God wanted to show mercy and grace, but time and time again, they would just ignore the prophets, didn't want to hear what the prophets had to say. And so Amos was one of those lines of prophets. And in actuality, from this point in time in history, it's a very short time, 722, when they fall to the Assyrian Empire and Israel as a kingdom is no more. Now, there were four major sins 
that were listed in the book of Amos that God or Amos, you know, God through Amos calls out the people. Now there were some like idolatry, Baal worship, sexual immorality, but then in those the headings and the passages, and as you read through in the previous chapters, this one, and then even going beyond that, four major sins were the exploitation of the poor and the oppression of the needy. And you know, these people were a wealthy nation, they lived well. And the, the, the rulers, the wealthy, uh, the people that, had, you know, that were running things in the country, they were taking the poor, taking from them, stealing from them to enrich themselves, make them, their lives better, all the while while they were treating the poor. And God, you know, it's one of those things that God does not like that. God warned them several times, you know, do not do this. And in fact, in one of the passages, I, I find it kind of interesting uh, you know, we tell our children, you know, when you're on the playground, don't call other kids names. It's not good. It's not nice. And it definitely is. But have you ever seen or noticed that in the Bible, there's biblical name calling? Think about it. Remember Jesus, the Pharisees? They were called vipers, foxes, other things like that. And it was very true. I mean, you know, the Pharisees, the leaders there uh, abused their power. They were not biblical and, you know, leading the people and everything. And Jesus called it out. And Amos does the very same thing. And in fact, in chapter four, uh, he likens the women of Samaria to the cows of Bashan. Now, Bashan was one of those places where, where it had you know, plenty of resources, and the cows of Bashan were the best looking, nicest, well-fed, plumpest, fat cows. Ladies, how would you like that, that you're compared to a bunch of fat cows? And that's exactly when Amos is calling them out because they're just taking everything from the poor, the needy, and enriching themselves, eating, drinking, wealth, you know, whatever, and they're doing it all at the purpose of, you know, taking from the poor. Also, you have the lack of justice and partiality of the judges. If you had power, you had wealth, you could get away with most anything. I think we see that here as well. The rich would flaunt their luxurious lifestyle in the face of coming disaster. They're like, I'm not worried about it. It's not going to happen. It's not coming. The arrogance that dares to flaunt itself in the face of prominent judgment. They were just like, you know, the prophets would come, tell them, and they're like, they're arrogant. They don't care. It's never going to happen to us. We're the, you know, in, in this region, in this time in history, we've got the power. We've got the military. We've got the great economy. And so there are a series of laments in the book of Hosea, and Amos is lamenting what is going to happen to them as a nation. He does not want to see it. He's warning them, turn back. You do not want God's hand of destruction upon you, God's punishment, his chastisement. Amos also laments the people's complacency and the affluence that will bring their destruction. So now let's go to Amos chapter 6, and we will begin reading in verse 1. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you noble men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Calneth and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath, and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fatted calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise of musical instruments. You drink wine by the bullfuls and use the finest lotions. But you do not give over the ruin of, or you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself, the Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. And at this time in history, as Amos is coming, Jeroboam II was king of the northern tribe of Israel there. And at this time, they were one of the most powerful nations, militarily, money, economy, at this time, of, among their neighbors and around there. They did not have a care, they did not have a worry, they did not have a concern as far as military threats, their economy. They were living life large. Things were going well. 
And here in this passage, it mentions both Zion and Samaria, and they are some of the capital cities. And both of these cities were constructed up on high hills, so they thought they're impregnable. So, you know, if anybody comes, we're fine. We've got the high ground. We're good. But that would change in just a handful of years. Amos makes a comparison to other cities around here in this passage. The people of Samaria, says, are no better off than these other cities. Israel is the big dog on the block, but they are overconfident, trusting in their own power and their own wealth, and not trusting in God as they had before. Uh, One of my previous pastors said about this passage, complacency is an insidious sin because it is based on lies, motivated by pride, and leads to trusting something or someone other than God. The phrase here in one of the passages, it says to put far away and to come near. I mean, those are two opposites. How can you do the two at the same time with being them complete opposites? And what it's saying here that the people are putting far off, the judgment's not going to happen to us. It's not going to come. It's not going to happen to us. You know, it's kind of that thing that if I don't see it, it doesn't exist. You know, put the blinders on. And yes, it's all around you. Yes, you can see it all. But, you know, I, I don't know it. Don't see it. It's not happening. And so that's what they were doing, but yet because of their doing that and blindly just following after the idols and their own lust, pleasures and stuff, the bring near, they were bringing near quicker, faster, their destruction at the same time. And they just did not want to hear what Amos had to say. They are living in the lap of luxury. They don't have a care in the world. The wealthy in Israel, their wealth is extravagant beyond means. I mean, the fact that it says that their beds were inlaid with ivory. I mean, they've got, you know, beautiful, probably beautiful wood beds, ivories in there. And even, you know, years later when the archaeologists have been, you know, excavating and stuff, they found many pieces of ivory in this city, you know, just showing that, you know, yes, you know, this is a true account here. And what the people were just, they had the nice couches, you know, nice house, nice furniture, uh, nice horse chariot. And, you know, think about our country today. Unlike any other country throughout the history of the world, and even our country today compared to other countries around the world, even if you are middle class or even on the lower middle class end, we live better than most people throughout history and most people around the world, even now, who are considered wealthier in their countries. And I mean, I remember when we went to the Czech Republic and I was talking to my translator and they had been one of those former Soviet bloc countries and his dad was a doctor. And we were telling him, you know, what, you know, as he was talking, asking his questions, he was shocked what doctors make in this country. You know, even with his dad currently now, when they've been liberated and stuff, and it just, you know, and some other things that they were telling us, living under communism and such, that, you know, we live very well in this country. And, like, even at my house, thinking about now, like, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, we bought a really nice couch chair for our, our family room there, and it's the nicest one we've ever had. It's like, it's black, it's leather, and, you know, your old days, your lazy boy, you grab your little thing, pull it up, and your feet thing comes up. Well, this one, you just push a button, and by a motor, it goes, you know, up like that, push a button, it goes down, headrest, push the button, goes up, down, you know, whatever. And then even we have, like, the little drink holders on there, and when you're watching your 4K TV in the dark and stuff, the little cup holders, you push a button, and your glass lights up blue, so you can find it, you know, in the dark when you're watching your movie. You know, that's the important thing, you don't want to spill your soda all over the couch or something. And then, like, in the middle part of the couch, you can just, it's like, you know, a regular thing there, but you can pull it down, it folds up to a big armrest, a little table on there. There's this other thing, you'll push a little button, and it goes up like that, and there's little plug-ins and USB ports, you can put your computer on there, and up on the top, there's even like a little, like, reading light that you can turn on, and, you know, direct it, shines down. So, I mean, you know, the stuff that we have today, compared to throughout the history of the world, we, we live extravagantly. We live well. And there are people that have way better couches than I even have, but that just shows you even us in the middle class here in this country today in our culture live very well. And these people in Israel, these rich, have the best of the best of their time, of their day, and of their age. And they are trusting in their wealth. They are trusting in their riches. They're trusting in themselves. 
And it also talks about that they ate well. And it talks about that the, the lambs and the calves and, you know, they have abundance. Now, the average Jewish family at this time in history would only eat meat a handful of times a year. And that'd be mainly like on their holidays and such that they had throughout the calendar. But as you see and describes here that the leaders and the wealthy, they had as much as they wanted, anytime they wanted, whenever they wanted. Now think about me, if I asked you all, how often do you eat meat every week? A lot of us, it's at least every single day, probably, and sometimes more than once a day, right? And yet, there again, how well do we live compared to people around the world now and even back then? But these, these wealthy people in Israel are much like us. They had it, they did it, they wanted it, they got it. And it also, they, they enjoyed the finest of music. Because they sit there and they compare themselves to David, who loved God, served God, played the instruments, praises to God, and you know, they've taken it and distorted it, and it's all for only pure pleasure for them. And then it even goes on to talk about drinking. And as far as their wine, and you know, like a lot of people, you know, you sit down, you go into a restaurant, you got your little, you know, wine glass, and the you know, waiter comes over, pours a little bit in there, you got your goblet. Well, with these people here, the way in comparison it's talking, they've got, everybody has their own punch bowl full of alcohol, okay? They're drinking to excess, because it says bowls. I mean, so we're talking, you know, a bigger than just like a goblet or a glass, and, you know, you name the lifestyle, the partying it up, they have it, they're doing it, whatever their eye sees, they want, they get, they have, they do it. And, you know, you think about it here, God has blessed these people greatly. And you say, why do you say that? You look back to King David. King David loved the Lord, served the Lord. And he brought that nation up, and then Solomon even propelled it even further beyond that. God blessed Israel greatly. But then as they started walking away from God, God showed much grace, much mercy over a long period of time. Always trying to warn them, turn back, turn back, turn back. But God had much grace on them. And the people are now at this point misusing God's blessings that he had bestowed upon them. And their love has waned and grown cold towards spiritual matters, towards the Lord, towards God. They are no longer serving God, but yet they are serving themselves now. They are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And we see that as a verse later on in Scripture. They have become complacent. In the beginning of the book of Revelation, you see where it talks about the seven churches. And it goes through, you know, chapter by chapter, and it lists the church. And then, it, you know, a lot of times it'll say some encouraging things that, you know, we're these things that you're doing for the Lord, these are great, these are awesome. And then some churches, you know, they're not, nothing's going well at all spiritually. And then a lot, even on the ones that are doing well, then it says, but I have this with you. And then it, you know, lists down some of the sins, some of the things going on in the church that need to be corrected. And there, you know, several things, uh, everything from idolatry to uh, wrong beliefs, wrong values, um, that their love has grown cold, uh, that they're tolerant of sin, heresies, wrong doctrine, lukewarmness, reliance on their riches, and a loss of the first love. I have a quote here, the author is unknown. Complacency is a blight that saps energy, dulls attitudes, and causes a drain on the brain. The first symptom is satisfaction with things as they are. The second is rejection of things as they might be. Good enough becomes today's watchword and tomorrow's standard. Complacency makes people fear the unknown, mistrust the untried, and abhor the new. Like water, complacent people follow the easiest course, downhill. They draw false strength from looking back. Very, very true statement. You know, as Christians, we have all experienced ups and downs in our spiritual life and in our spiritual walk. We have seen God's mighty hand at work in our lives. We have had the mountaintop experiences where we're just like floored at the things God has done. We have worked hard. We have fought against spiritual forces of darkness in our lives. We have labored, we have worked tirelessly, 
And sometimes we come to that point where we just need a rest. And it's easy for us to let our guard down, to relax, to become comfortable, to become complacent. Satan will use any means to sidetrack us. You know, sometimes it's that frontal assault in your face, but a lot of times Satan is very subtle in what he does to get us sidetracked. And all of the luxuries the world has to offer are very attractive. And not that there's anything necessarily wrong with some of those things, but the fact is, is we, we, we lose our focus spiritually and we begin pursuing after and wanting all of these things. And in a way you could say Satan uses those things to lull us to sleep slowly that we do not realize how far we've slid and where, how complacent we've become in our lives. It's easy for us, after all the hard work of serving, to want to take a breather. Or we have things in life, things are going well, things are going smoothly, and the cares of the world begin to wear us down, and our spiritual walk begins to wane and slow down, and we become complacent. Our spiritual walk has been just like on a gradual slide like this, and we do not even realize how far we are drifting, 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 drifting until like, boom, you know, it's too late, you're too far away. I mean, not that God can't do that and things can change, but we get drifting in such a way that we don't even know and realize how far we've went away from God. And we become satisfied with things as they are, as we are, and not wishing to change anything because everything's okay. We all become complacent in areas of our life. It happens. We're sinners. We're, we live in a fallen world. We're fallen people. All of us at different times in our life and in different areas become complacent. The issue is, do you recognize it? Do you see it when it's happening or as it's happened or after it's happened? And then the important part to that also follow up is, then what do you do about it? Because, like I said, it's all going to happen. I can guarantee you, every single one of us in this room, myself included, we have all become complacent in different times, different areas, different whatever in our life, and we've slid from where we once were at one time. And yet the Bible tells us to strive to be what? Christ-like each and every day. So the question is, is how do we remove and go beyond complacency in our hearts and in our lives? And you go back to Revelation, and in one of there, it gives a little formula for that when it talks about that they lost their first love. And so if you look at some of those points just in that verse there, one of them is repent. And the fact is, is ask God for forgiveness. And not only ask God for forgiveness for where we're at in our life, but the fact is, is ask God for help. Because I don't know about you, but you know, like being a Christian for a long time, being a pastor, studying the Bible as much as we do, and all of us do, not even just me as a pastor, but you as well. And sometimes I just feel like, I don't know, like I'm dumb, stupid. Because you know, like, sometimes I don't have the answers. And I should have the answers. I'm a leader. I should know everything, right? I mean, that's how we feel. And yet there are times where I'm just like, God, I don't know how to answer this. God, I don't know how to fix this. And the fact is, is our reliance needs to be on him and asking him for the help, the guidance, the direction. Because even, you know, many times just leading the kids, leading the church, doing the things that we do as, as pastors, leading the people. You know, you look to me like I know everything. I really don't. <laughs> Pastor Dean knows even less. <laughs> I don't talk to him I said that. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing, though. People look to us to lead them, and that's what we need to do, and that's the job God has given us. But I, I, to be honest with you, sometimes I don't know the answer. And you know what? A lot of us, we don't know the answer. God does, though. And, you know, I, I've noticed in my life that when I pray, God, please help me in this area. Please show me the answer. He does. And he guides you. And so, you know, not only is it repentance, but ask God for help to get out of where we're at. Because you know, we're blinded to our own sin. We're blinded to our own problems. We don't see them and always recognize them. The next one's another R. Remember. Remember where you came from. Remember what you did at first. And I want you to think about this. When you first became a Christian, or when you were on the high pinnacle of your Christian walk, Christian life, and you were on fire for God, you were excited about, about God, 
And in fact, you could not wait for the church doors to be open. You were here. It didn't matter what was going on, what day of the week. You would cancel other things on your schedule. You would make your schedule such that you were here all the time. And it wasn't that the pastor was guilting you or trying to make you come or force you or whatever. But the fact is, in your heart, you loved it. You wanted to be here. You were excited about being here. And if there was, uh, you know, something that needed to be done, you were the first volunteer and going, I'll do it, I'll do it, I got it. But then sometimes our busyness of life, just all the various things of family, work, and all the things, and busyness of church, sometimes we can get to the point where we're overburdened, and you're like, I'm doing too much, I can't keep up with this. And so usually, sadly, what are some of the first things that we jettison? Usually the things that count for eternity. We get more caught up in our, our worldly existence of things going on that I need to take care of those. And, you know, I got to do a little less at church because I need a little more time for myself. It's all about priorities, isn't it? And there again, for me too. And, you know, speaking of that, even that example of our Christian walk and our love with God, that relationship, guys, girls, how about, speaking of Valentine's Day, how about your relationship with your wife, your husband? Think about when you first met them, when you began dating. Uh, my wife and I, we met in high school. And actually, yesterday was the day I asked her out 34 years ago. It was a long time. She's put up with me forever, man. <laughs> anyway, think back to those days of early dating. And just the, the, the love you had for each other, the excitement you had for each other. And my wife and I, we'd be in school all day together. But, you know, as soon as we got in the car, got home, what were we doing? Going over, taking the phone, calling, spending hours on the phone. Mom and dad yelling at you that, you know, you only have one line back in those days. I need the phone. I need to call somebody. I'm waiting on a call. So, you know, you hang up. And then later that night, you call me, fall, fall asleep on the phone. You cannot wait to talk to them, hang out with them hang on every word, remember all the neat things about them. And guys, I mean, even if you're clumsy romantically, you're sitting there reading, asking guys, people for ideas, you know, whatever it is, so that you can woo this girl, so that you can make her fall in love with you. And all those little things that you do along the way. But then, you get married. <laughs> yeah, you all laugh because you know where this is going. And then we just become comfortable. And we all of a sudden stop doing those little things that we used to do at one time. And we stop, you know, spending as much time together or communicating as much. And what happens? You begin to drift away. And, you know, divorce is, you know, a big thing around the world, our country, throughout history, because we, we, we drift away. And, you know, I've had times in my marriage where I'm way far miles from her. And you always got to you know, be kicked in the head and go, oh, you know, remember, you know, start doing those little details, those little things that you did at first to win them over, to woo them, to show them that you love and care about them. And same thing, in our relationships, in our marriages, we, come, we become complacent. We just become comfortable and not doing the things that we once did. And so that, that part in there where it says, remember what you did at first, remember what you did in the beginning. Remember how your love used to be. Which brings us to the next point, and it's do. Do the works you did at first. All those little things that you did for your wife, that you did for your husband, that you did for each other, all those little cutesy names you called each other, and all that kind of stuff. Rekindle that. Bring it back anew. And the same thing goes in our relationship with God. Are we reading our Bible as much as we used to? Are we here at church as much as we possibly can be? Are we being involved in the activities of the church? Are we reaching out to other people and seeing if they need help or this or that, our Christian brothers in Christ? But, or are we too busy? I've got a lot going on, uh, my work, my family, my this, that, the other, that I just don't have time for those things. There again, it's all a matter of priorities. And God will always give you enough time to do what he has for you to do. And then the next point is renew. Renew each day. And in the Bible, there are many verses. I just picked out a few. Psalm 51.10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, 
and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And David, the chief of sinners, you know, I mean, you know, killed, had somebody killed, adultery, you know, various things. You know, he's asking God on a daily basis, create in me a clean heart, make my heart right. And there are times where I just got to ask God that too, because some of my thoughts, feelings about various things, people, this, you know, whatever, are not right, and I know it. And sometimes you're like, how do I get that out of my head? And like David, he says, God created me a clean heart. But then he goes on to say, and renew a right spirit, a new. Each and every day is a new day. Even though you may have failed yesterday, today is a new day. Today is a new day to renew those things in Christ. In Romans, it says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The fact that our thoughts and mind need to be continually changing, becoming more like Jesus, more thoughts each and every day. Colossians, and having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. There again, be Christ-like. Are we becoming more like Jesus each and every day as we go along? You might have failed yesterday, you might have failed in the past, but that doesn't mean that we need to hold on to, keep, and wallow in that same failure today. It's anew. In Ephesians, and like, yeah, I've read the verse before, but there was, I don't know how many years ago it was, but one time I was sitting there and I read this verse, and I was like, wow, I mean, it just like jumped out to me more than it ever had. And it says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. And I was like, wow. The fact that, guys, my imagination, my thoughts, I mean, can run wild and crazy. I can imagine big, crazy things that, you know, whatever. And the fact is, is God can make those things happen. God can do beyond what you can imagine and beyond what you can think you can do. God can use you in greater ways than you could even imagine, think, fathom, know, comprehend. And it's because his power is working inside of you. We don't need to be complacent. Don't just settle for the blasé life, the mundane life. There is much more that it can be for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, At this time, we are going to do communion. Now, if you did not pick up a communion cup. Uh, John is going to be coming around. Please hold up your hand. Just give him enough time to get over to you and get you those cups. Uh, They're both coming around. Just keep it up long enough so that they can get you one. And to partake in communion here at Grace, you do not have to be a member at Grace Bible Church, but you do need to be a member of the body of Christ. And you're like, what do you mean by that? And what do I mean by that is the question is this. If you were to die right now, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven or not? We're all going to die someday. Where are you going? And the Bible tells us that, you know, if you you be a really good person, do a lot of nice things, that no matter what you do, you cannot earn favor with God. You cannot earn your way to heaven. But yet the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ loved us. He came to this world. He's perfect. He was God. He died on the cross. He paid for all of our sins, all the things that you've done, all the things that I've done. And then he rose again three days later, proving that he was God. And the amazing thing about the gospel is it says this, all you need to do is place your faith and trust in him and you'll go to heaven someday. That is an amazing thing because you can't work for it. You can't earn it in your goodness and greatness. And so I urge you, if you've not done that, please do so today. If you have more questions about that, please speak with myself or any one of the other leaders here at Grace. Uh, With that said, uh, as communion, you got that top little layer, then the bottom little layer, just peel off the top layer so that it exposes the wafer part of it. And communion is a representation of what I just shared with you. Christ's death, burial, resurrection, what he did for us. And we remember that through the communion. And communion is also a time that we examine our hearts and our lives and see where, where am I at? What do I need to change? How can I be more Christ-like? And so I'm going to lead in prayer and just you know, pray silently to yourself and confess those things to God as well. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity to come here to meet together and to partake in communion. 
We just ask, Lord, there's so much that we have done, but we just ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your grace and your mercy. Make our hearts clean. Make our hearts right before you, Lord. We thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your sacrifice and salvation, which you provided to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Corinthians, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now take and peel back the other part and try not to spill it as you do it. (laughs) Also in Corinthians, it says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, I just want to thank you all for coming and joining us today, and just be in prayer for Pastor Dean. They, I don't know if I had mentioned that earlier, but they are up in New York. He took some kids up to like a snow camp, he, Joel, Janelle, and his wife, and a group of kids, so they're up there. I think they're heading back today. Uh, when I talked to them on Thursday, it's like there was like three feet of snow where they were at, and many Florida kids have never seen snow, so they thought it was the greatest thing, but you know, if they had to live in it and drive in it, I probably wouldn't think the same, but anyway... Let's pray, and then you're all dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and thank you for this time. And we just ask, Lord, that we have the great opportunity each day to serve you. We just ask, Lord, that we would put complacency out of our hearts and just be, have that excitement and love again for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.